Hello, welcome back to Dr. Donovan Medicine Made Easy. In today's video, we're going to be covering impetigo, which is a common, acute, superficial bacterial skin infection characterized by pustules and honey-colored crusted erosions, as you can see in this photograph. Ulcerated impetigo is called eczema. We'll be covering that later in the video. And in general, impetigo is common in children. However, it can be seen in adults and it's prevalent worldwide. So this is a really important and common condition for you to be aware of. The images that I've used in this video have largely been used from Dermnet, which is a fantastic resource for dermatology. I strongly encourage you to check it out and I've included the link for you in the description box of this video. So in this video, we're going to be covering causes of impetigo, types as well as clinical features, and those are going to be the broad types. We'll be looking at the treatment of impetigo as well as prevention. So what causes impetigo? Well, impetigo is most commonly caused by the bacterial infection with Staphylococcus aureus. Non-bullous impetigo can be caused by group A, beta hemolytic streptococcus. The way I remember this is that aureus in Latin means gold and you get an impetigo, you get these honey colored gold looking crusted lesions. So it's a good way to remember the causative agent of impetigo. The following factors usually predispose to impetigo. So things such as atopic dermatitis, scabies or any skin trauma. So things like chicken pox, insects bites, abrasions or lacerations. And that's because people are scratching and itching at the skin and you can get entry of um, the staph aureus into these infected and scratched away sites. So we're going to now be covering three broad types of impetigo. So those are non-bullous impetigo, bullous impetigo and eczema. So let's start off with non-bullous impetigo. So in non-bullous impetigo, staphylococci and streptococci invade a site of minor trauma where exposed proteins allow the bacteria to adhere. So non-bullous impetigo starts off as a pink macule that then evolves into a vesicle or pustule and then into erosions with this honey-coloured crust. Untreated impetigo usually resolves within two to four weeks without scarring. And although many children are otherwise generally well with impetigo, some can get lymphadenopathy, a mild fever and some general malaise. So now that we've covered non-bullous impetigo, and this is a picture of what it looks like, let's take a look at the other type or major type, which is bullous impetigo. So bullous impetigo, again, is the bacterial skin infection caused by Staphylococcus aureus that results in the formation of these large blisters that you can see here called bulla. And these are usually in areas with skin folds, so things such as the armpit, the groin, between the fingers or toes, beneath the breast or between the buttocks. So now we've had a look at non-bullous impetigo as well as bullous impetigo, let's move on and have a look at eczema. So eczema, also known as deep impetigo, starts off as a non-bullous impetigo, but it then develops into a punched out necrotic ulcer. And you can see that in this photograph here, that usually heals slowly and it can leave a scar. Eczema is usually due to strep pyogenes, but co-infection with staph aureus can occur. So how is impetigo diagnosed? Well, in terms of diagnosis, impetigo is usually diagnosed clinically. So that means you'll go to the doctor or healthcare professional and they'll make this clinical diagnosis based on what your skin looks like. But it can be confirmed with bacterial swabs, which can be sent for microscopy, culture and sensitivity. Sometimes if you're very unwell, people might do bloods because that could reveal an elevated white cell count due to increased neutrophils when impetigo is widespread. In this video, I'm not going to be covering the histology of impetigo because I think that that is beyond the scope of this video. However, if you're really interested in the histological characteristics of the different types of impetigo, then check out Dermnet and I've included the link in the description box for the video. So let's generally finish off by talking about um, general treatment of impetigo as well as preventative measures. So in terms of treatment, I'd like to split this down into two things. I'd like us to think about general treatment as well as specific. So in terms of general treatment, basic things like cleansing the wound, using moist soaks to remove crust gently, and applying antiseptic two to three times daily for five days can be helpful. In terms of more specific things, so things that are specific to impetigo, oral antibiotics are usually recommended if the symptoms are significant or severe. So for example, someone has a fever or malaise, there are three or more lesions, there's a high risk of complications, or the infection isn't resolving or is unlikely to resolve. And in terms of specific 
specific antibiotics? Well, you'd be thinking of oral flu cloxacillin, 500 milligrams to a gram in inf severe infection four times a day for seven days, and that's the adult dose. But the specific antibiotics are going to depend on whether the patient has got any allergies, as well as local antibiotic prescribing guidelines, etc. In terms of topical antibiotics, well, sometimes people ask, can we give things like fusidic acid? Well, the answer is that it's usually discouraged due to the potential to develop bacterial resistance as well as contact allergic dermatitis. In terms of preventative measures, well, let's move on and have a quick think about what we can do to prevent things. So in terms of prevention, you want to be thinking of things like naseptin cream. So that's a cream that can be applied into the nostrils, um, although you want to avoid that in patients who've got peanut allergies. You want to be washing patients daily with antibacterial soaps, so washing, as well as cutting nails, keeping the hands clean, so hand hygiene. And then you also want to identify and treat the source of reinfection. So that's usually another infected person or a carrier in the household as it's a contagious skin infection. In terms of reducing the chance of passing the infection to another person, well, avoid close contact with others, especially if you know someone has an infection. Children must stay away from school until the crusts have dried out or for 24 hours after starting oral antibiotics. It's important that you encourage children to use separate towels and flannels to the rest of the household if they have impetigo, as well as change and launder clothes and linen daily. So I hope you found that very helpful. Remember, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, I'd be very grateful if you could do so. And if you enjoyed the video, please remember to like it. Thanks again for watching, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have in the comments section underneath this video. And please check out the description box for really useful links and extra resources. Thank you.